Hi guys, welcome back. This is Professor Hank, and in this video, I'm going to show you how to do some debugging using a technique known as hand tracing. Okay, so some points before we get into it. Point number one is that this is a technique you can use to find logic errors. Now, what's a logic error? A logic error is a type of error where you know you run your program, it compiles or it executes fine. There's no syntax errors, is what I'm trying to say. But for some reason, you get the wrong number, right? Or the wrong output or whatever. So let's say that you write a program, it's supposed to um, add two numbers together, you know, and ask you for the two numbers, you type in five and two, and for some reason, the output is 99, right? Or some other crazy, you know, you get garbage values out, right? So that could be an example of a logic error. Okay, there's no, there's nothing syntactically wrong with it. The code executes, it's just you get the wrong output, you get the wrong answer or whatever. Okay, so point number two is the keys to how this thing works. What happens is that your brain, you use your brain as the CPU, you use a piece of paper as memory, as you know, the computer's memory, and then the um, code is the code, right? And so you step through each instruction one after the other and you use your brain to interpret the instruction and then you update memory which is that piece of paper okay and then you can see what's happening in memory as you step through the instructions and by going through this process eventually hopefully the error becomes you know apparent now point number three is that debugger programs they automate this this is what debuggers do they just automate the process for you so that way you don't have to have that paper, okay? Um, you know, you, you step through the code, step over the code. You know, debugger programs that ship with Visual Studio code blocks, you know, or the debugger program in Python Idle, they do this for you. They keep track of variables in your memory and how they change as each uh, instruction executes, okay? And so it's up to you to recognize where the problem is as you are stepping through the code. Okay, now point number four is this technique is also how you can understand code in some algorithms, right? So an algorithm, so you, you have um, some algorithms written in pseudocode or even plain language, right? You know, if you just read those things, right? It's just words on a page. Unless you really dig into the meat of, you know, sample code or, you know, the printed algorithms or what you see in a textbook or whatever, you're not really gonna understand what's happening with those algorithms, how they work, or how that sample code works, unless you dig into them, you know, line by line, at least a little bit, so you can get a feel for how they actually work. Programming is about managing your memory, so if you can't understand what's happening in memory, you can't program, okay? Um, and then point five, this is something that I stress to my students. You must be able to do this. This is a fundamental foundational skill that helps you to understand, as I was saying just a second ago, what's happening in memory and how to find what's wrong with your code, okay? If you can do this successfully, then you understand the code that was written and you can you can find logic errors, okay? The logic errors are different than syntax errors. I'll cover how you can debug syntax errors in another video. For right now though, we're just gonna focus on hand tracing. All right, so let's see an example of applying this technique to find a logic error in a relatively simple program. All right, so on the right, I've got a program that I wrote that I think is gonna find the average of three numbers, okay? So uh, I'll go ahead and run it. And, you know, I'll enter three numbers, 10, 20, and 30, right? Now, before I hit enter after 30, what should the average be? Well, 10 plus 20 plus 30 is gonna be 60, 60 divided by three is 20. So that average should be 20, right? Now my program says incorrectly that the average is 40, okay? So this is an example of a logic error. I'm expecting 20 to come out and instead I got 40. Something's wrong, gotta figure it out, gotta find out what the problem is. All right, so let's walk through an example of doing hand tracing. Okay, so on the right hand side, I got my code. On my left hand side, I got my piece of paper. And remember, your piece of paper represents your computer's memory, right? And so what we're doing is we're creating what sometimes is referred to as a memory map, right? You know, I'm basically gonna 
show us how our memory changes over time as the program executes. Brain's the CPU, paper's memory, and then the code is the code. Okay, so here's how you do it. You just go through one line at a time. So if you look at this first line of code, what happens? Well, this variable called uh, num1 comes into existence. Okay, now what's this line of code do? Well, it asks the user to enter, in, enter in a number. So in my example, I typed in 10, right? Well, what goes into the num1 variable? Not an integer, right? Because remember, the input function returns a string. So what's going in there is the string 10, right? So that's the first line. Second line, it right, takes what's inside of num1 and then returns an integer copy of it and then overwrites what's in num1 with it. So what we end up with after that second line is the integer 10 assigned to num1, okay? And then we're gonna go to the next line of code, do a similar thing, num2 comes into existence, okay? And we ask user for a number, they typed 20, that was me, I typed 20, and then the string 20 was returned, placed into num2. The next line happens, we feed that string num2, that, that string that's associated with num2, the string 20, into the end function, what it returns is the integer 20, which overwrites what was in num2. And then we're gonna do some more thing for num3, right? The user typed the string 30, gets stored in num3, and then, yeah, that was for this line of code right here. And the next line of code executes, what happens? That string 30 gets fed to int, int returns an integer version or an integer copy, which we assign to num3, overriding the string version. So now we've got three variables, 10, 20, 30. So now we come up to this line right here, the average line, and that causes the average variable to come into existence, right? And so uh, what gets assigned there? Well, we look at this arithmetic expression here and we go through, and our, using our brain again, order of operations tells us that division happens first, right? So um, num3 divided by 3. Well, what's num3? 30. 30 divided by 3 is what? 10. Okay. And then we take num1 and num2, which was 10 and 20, and that gives us 40, which gets assigned to average. But wait a minute. The average of 10, 20, and 30 is 20, not 40. So guess what line of code was the problem? This one right here, because we expect that average should have 20 assigned to it, not 40. So this is my problematic line of code. Okay, so at this point, that's my, that's my idea. It seems pretty obvious to me. So I have to come up with a fix, right? A hypothesis as to what would fix it. Well, what I need is, based on how I know averages to work, I have to do the addition first and then the division, right? So that means that I have to override my order of operations, okay? So that's what I think my fix is. That's my hypothesis. Now I need to test that hypothesis, right? So I'm going to go ahead and run it again. So now I type in my 10, I type in my 20, I type in my 30, and boom, it's fixed, right? So that's really all there is to it, right? Your brain is the CPU, piece of paper is memory, and then you just trace through the lines of code one at a time um, until hopefully something sticks out um, at you that's obvious as to what the problem is, like it was here. Now, if at any time I was reading lines of code here and I wasn't sure how to update my memory, well, that would clue me in that I wrote some code here that I don't know what it does, right? So for example, if I was like, all right, let's go look at this first line here. All right, what does input do? I'm not sure. Well, that's a clue that you should go back to the text or whatever your source material is and go, okay, how does input work? What actually does go in num1, right? If you don't know that, then you don't have any business writing a program that uses the input function, right? You need to go back and relearn how the input function works. What if I'm on line two here? I'm like, well, I don't know what the int function does. I'm not sure what to put in num1. Time for you to go back to the textbook and read up on the int function or go to python.org or whatever, right? And so on. If you're not sure, if you looked at, you know, this average line and you're like, well, I don't see any reason, you know, that this should be giving me the wrong answer. 
You know, you look at that and you don't understand the order of operations. You're like, well, num one, num two, num three, divided by three, that should be correct, right? I mean, what's, what's the problem? Well, if you couldn't figure that out, if you didn't see that the problem was the order of operations, well, that should clue you in to go back and review, you know, doing basic arithmetic in Python or, or whatever programming language you're using, right? This isn't something that's just limited to Python. I mean, this is a technique for finding logic errors, no matter what program language you're using. All right, so let's look at another example of using hand tracing. And in this case, we'll start off with some code that was already written. Maybe we didn't write it ourselves and we want to figure out what it's doing, right? So we'll, we'll trace through it. Brain's going to be the computer. Paper is going to be, you know, um, memory. And we'll just go through the code and discover what this program does without even running it, right? So let's 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 get started with it so when that first line happens you got x equals int right that input and basically what that's doing is that's asking the user for a number and that number is going to get converted and stored into x so let's say that they type um uh, seven okay so the integer seven is assigned to x now the second line happens right and that line uh is going to store in y whatever integer they type so let's say they type um, four this time okay so we got our two variables that look like that the next line z equals zero assigns the integer zero to z and then we get to that while loop right so let's trace through that while loop. well while y is greater than zero well it is four is greater than zero so we enter the body of the loop what do we do we add the contents of x to z so what's in x seven so that z becomes seven and then we subtract one from y okay so once we do that, we go to the top of the loop. Is y greater than zero? Yep, so enter the body of the loop. What do we do? Add x to z. x is still seven, so z becomes 14. And then we subtract one from y. Go to the top of the loop. Is y greater than zero? Yes. Enter the body of the loop. Add x to z again. x is still seven. So z, which was 14, becomes 21. Subtract one from y. Y becomes one, go to the top of the loop. Is Y greater than zero? Yes, because one's greater than zero, enter the body of the loop. Add X to Z one more time, All right? So that's 28, subtract one from Y. Y becomes zero, go to the top of the loop. Is Y greater than zero? Nope, while loop's done, go to print Z. What do we print out? 28. So what numbers did we, did we enter in at the beginning? It was seven, for x and y for four. So what did we just end up doing, right? Now, the answer is 28, but what's seven times four? 28. So what we just did is we used a loop to multiply two numbers together, right? Um, so let's test it out. Let's see if we get to actually get 28. That's what we think is gonna happen. Okay, so seven and four, 28. Okay, let's try um, a different number, right? Just to make sure that we're, you know, multiply two different numbers together just to make sure that, you know, it wasn't a one-off, right? So how about five times six? Oh, look, it's 30. How about um, 30 times four? Oh, look, it's 120, right? So we just discovered how that this program is multiplying two, uh, two numbers together. And how is it multiplying those two numbers together? By doing repeated additions. Okay, so that's going to bring this video to a close. If you felt that the video was useful, please consider giving the video a thumbs up. And if you thought that the video sucked, well, then you've got that thumbs down button as an option as well. If you'd like to see more videos, if you're interested in more content from the channel, feel free to hit that subscribe button. And as usual, if you're a student of mine, and you have further questions, feel free to drop me an email or to stop by my office hours. Okay, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.